Okay. Thank you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this today and tomorrow. Uh, and this afternoon with the exercise session, which is not ready yet, so. Uh, okay. So I'm going to talk about polynomial matrices and univariate ones. Uh, I have four points for this morning, probably a bit too much, but we'll see what we can cover in the fourth one. But we'll start with simple things, even without polynomial matrices, just matrices by themselves and polynomials by themselves. And since that's the first talk of the week, and since the subjects I'm going to tackle are really basic in computer algebra, I thought I could start with basic facts about computer algebra. So, our symbolic computation, as we call it. <laughs> it takes some space to see what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, so these are five books that are fundamental in the, in the field. Uh, the first one is about complexity theory, in particular lower bounds. The second one is our Bible. Uh, the third one as well, but in French. Uh, the third one is available uh, online for free. The other one, once as well, but not legally, so. Um, and the last two there are specifically about polynomial and matrix computations, so things I'm going to talk about today, and uh, the last one about multivariate ideals and Gromner basis computations, etc. Okay, so these are examples of very important books in our field, and there are other important things which are software. Uh, so you probably know many of these uh, software, so Maple, Magma, MATLAB, Sage, Mathematica. These all have, even MATLAB, they, these all have some symbolic computation inside. Some of them are really about symbolic computation, SIMP, uh, most of them in fact. But even MATLAB, for example, has some symbolic computation tool inside, okay? So that's really a part of the field to focus on software as well and not only on uh, algorithms and writing them on paper. So I would summarize the field. Uh, a summary is never perfect, but I would summarize it as designing algorithms and uh, doing software implementations for exact computations with mathematical objects. Um, so Euclid was doing computer algebra somehow. Uh, you know about Euclid's algorithm for the GCD. There is Gaussian elimination, which is actually quite old. Uh, you can find it in old Chinese textbooks from the second century. Newton's method is very important. I'm going to use it today, this morning. So these three names are maybe not really computer algebra. Computers didn't exist at, at the time, but they were focusing on fast computations for practical purposes. And actually, if you, if you open the modern computer algebra book, uh, there are five parts, and three parts have Euclid and Gauss and Newton's name. So these really are important um, things that are the, the roots of the domain. Then you have the FFT, which is a very important operation for fast computations. I'm going to talk about it just later. Uh, Karatsubas algorithm was one of the first non-trivial fast polynomial multiplication algorithm. Strassen's algorithm for matrices. Borbeger's algorithm for Gromner basis. Uh, which opens many new perspectives. And for example, you also have uh, the LLA algorithm for finding short vectors in lattices or the NFS for factoring integers. So these are very important and diverse uh, algorithms from the field. Uh, you can notice that I stopped around 90, but some things happened uh, more recently, right? Uh, okay, and maybe for the FFT, it's not so clear that uh, this is from 1805, uh, in fact, it was known to Gauss, a very general version of the FFT. Uh, and this was 1805 in some, some uh, writing of Gauss. And then many other things. Uh, the most famous one nowadays is from Cooley and Tucky in 65, recently. But actually it was used a lot of times before. And we had a very nice course about this uh, two years ago at GNCF by Joris. One thing you can see is that here it's not FFT for the purpose of FFT. It's FFT for some application. So here Gauss was focusing on uh, celestial bodies and some uh, interpolation of orbits. Okay, so that's really, there is a motivation. It's not fast computing for fast computing. It's fast computing for something which usually is, uh, has some interest somehow. So computer algebra has a goal 
to have some applications somewhere. And these are examples of fields where uh, there are many applications of uh, computer algebra. So in biology, for example, you have some interpolation for uh, gene networks. In robotics, you have lots of applications of ground basis. Combinatorics, I'm not going to talk about it. There are lots of people in this room and we'll have some uh, this week. Uh, who do this. Uh, crypto encoding theory is a natural field. I'm going to talk about it just afterwards. Again, algebraic geometry. We'll have a few talks this week about this. Uh, graph theory uses linear algebra tools in particular for fast computations. And number theory, well, uh, we have uh, complete teams in France devoted to this algorithmic number theory. Okay, so there is a goal to have uh, some to use the algorithms for something and, and that motivates us to develop new and faster algorithms. And when I say exact computation, I don't want to rule out people and to say uh, we don't want to care about what happens in non-exact settings. So there are interesting contexts where there is uh, rounding errors, where there can be instability, etc. And we have very close colleagues uh, who work on this. So for example, this week, uh, we have two talks at least that I could spot, which clearly are not completely in the exact computation setting. I'm still focusing on this in this talk on exact computations. I will not mention rounding errors or instability or things like this. Okay. I forgot to say that if you have any question, any comments, please interrupt me. Uh, so, one reason for having uh, exact computations is when you work on discrete structures, discrete data, which comes, for example, from uh, digital communication. Then typically in crypto or coding theory, you will work on uh, finite field elements, Z over PZ, for example, and then you don't have any rounding error when you work on this. Um, in this context, you will need, for example, either to send lots of messages in a short time, you want crypto systems which can uh, encrypt things very fast, many things very fast, or you want to study the, for example, how to break RSA, then you have one problem to solve, but a very big one. So usually you have some intensive computations, either because you should be very fast for a small thing, or as fast as you can for a very large and difficult problem. And what you encounter in this context is usually matrices of large size, which often have some specific structure related to your problem. Uh, you can encounter polynomials or polynomial matrices in a variable and polynomials in several variables as well. And our goal, again, is to provide fast algorithms and, if possible, implementations to solve these problems. And one general methodology I wanted to highlight this morning is that we try to reduce as much as possible to basic operations. And basic operations are mostly multiplication things. Usually addition is easy. And you want to reduce as efficiently as you can to basic operations. I'm going to explain this a bit more. <coughs> but before this, uh, I should maybe say what I mean by efficient or efficiency. So uh, we have algorithms for some basic mathematical objects with coefficients in some base field k, which can be anything you like, a prime field typically, or a field extension, the rationals, a number field, whatever. So you have polynomials, say, in a base field k over a base field k. And what I'm focusing in, uh, on in this talk is uh, low complexity bound, so you have a good complexity, and also a low execution time. Uh, which sometimes don't match. Often they do match, but not always. And things I'm not going to focus on is uh, memory usage or power consumption. That's not an issue for the algorithms I'm, not going, to, I'm going to mention. So more uh, precisely for the complexity bounds, I use the algebraic complexity model, which means that I'm just counting the number of operations in K that the algorithm is doing. So I look at the algorithm, I count the number of operations in the base field. And I try to give an, up, an upper bound on it. That's a standard model for this kind of computations. And it's actually often well correlated to the timings of some implementation that you would do if uh, you are working over a prime field. If you are working, for example, over the rationals, then this does not take into account uh, coefficient growth. 
You are just saying that adding two rationals costs one, whatever the size of the rationals, okay? So it's not always the perfect model, there is no perfect model, but in many cases it's quite, uh, quite relevant. About practical performance, so the execution time uh, part, I'm going to measure software running time. Uh, so this is of course very much influenced by which algorithm I picked and how I wrote the implementation, what language, uh, how it was done. And in this talk, I'm going to use uh, my small laptop here, which is four years old. And it has this not, not so good, uh, not so recent processor inside. I will not talk about multi-threading, parallel things, etc. I just have one thread. That's it. Okay. So going back to the multiplication problems, the basic problems. For matrices, uh, this is a matrix. Oops, there. That's a matrix of a uh, uh, F97. Okay, three by four matrix. And you know that you can add them in M square. You can multiply them naively in M cube. And one breakthrough was by Strassen who showed how to do subcubic matrix multiplication. This was actually a breakthrough. Now, it, now we have <coughs> incorporated this. It seems like a basic algorithm that we learn where, when we start, but actually this was really something new and which launched a whole field of research. And so the complexity exponent here is uh, 281 more or less. And uh, in practice, it's used by all nice uh, libraries which do matrix multiplication. Especially in this context, there is no stability problem. So if you have a matrix with more than a few hundred uh, rows and columns, you use Strassel's algorithm. Um, there are better algorithms in terms of complexity, so uh, you have all the coppersmith Vinograd uh, kinds of algorithms which reach, which are much closer to two now, which is the lower bound you could expect to reach one day maybe. Uh, it's much closer to two, but we cannot use them in practice at the moment uh, as such. Maybe one day we can have some variants of them, but for the moment we can't use them. So the best one we can use in practice is this one. Okay, uh, so Strassen actually wrote a paper which was called Gaussian Elimination is Not Optimal. The title was not Faster Matrix Multiplication. The title was Gaussian Elimination is Not Optimal. He's focusing on the consequence of his result on matrix multiplication. He sees matrix multiplication, uh, I'm putting words in his mouth maybe, but he sees matrix multiplication as a means towards the applications and Gaussian Elimination has many <coughs> more applications than matrix multiplication by itself. So he does two things in this paper, faster matrix multiplication and a, a nice reduction from Gaussian elimination to matrix multiplication. So you can see the slide here is slightly different from uh, the rest of my slides before. Uh, that's because I, I stole it from someone. Uh, so that's a guy who made a talk about, in particular, matrix multiplication. This is on YouTube, and you can see that uh, there are 189 views and zero comments, so apparently it's there. Some people prefer some other things on YouTube. Um, okay, so this metric maybe of measuring how much we view our reference things is not always perfect. You can see other examples where the number of views and comments is quite larger. Um, so I let you judge which, one, which thing is of better quality, if we can say. And um, so, yeah. The message here, if we forget these things above, is uh, that we have two things to do. Design very fast algorithms and implementations for the most basic routines, okay? Uh, so these ones we have to focus on, and then design efficient reductions for other tasks, linear system solving, determinant, inverse, etc. All right. Uh, now polynomials, univariate polynomials. So you have a polynomial of degree uh, eight, of degree seven there. And you know that we can add them, you can evaluate them at a point in uh, Biko of T operations. And the naive multiplication, just use the formula, you get D square. Karatsuba, 
a bit before Strassen showed uh, that you can actually do better than quadratic. This was an answer to someone, uh, actually a famous mathematician, Kolmogorov, if I remember well, who said, I think d square is optimal. And no, it's not. Um, then there were subsequent improvements, and actually for polynomials we reach quasi-linear complexity, so we have d log d log log d operations in general, and there are many nice contexts where you can actually do d log d or something close to it. And this is uh, all revolving around FFT, the fast Fourier transform, and this is used in practice, not necessarily this most general algorithm, but in practice if you multiply polynomials uh, with integer coefficients over some z pz, etc. it's very likely that over a degree, a few hundreds, uh, you are going to use FFT. If it's in Maple, in NTL, in whatever, it's using FFT. And you can measure timings and see that the progression of timings is indeed quasi-linear. Okay, so that works very well, and uh, the question is not closed, though. Uh, there is still an extra log-log, at least, which we would like to remove. Uh, we don't know how to, but there, there is recent progress by Harvey van der Hoeven and Lesser on this. Okay, uh, so I showed reductions uh, through Strassen's paper for matrices, and here I'm showing some code because we all like uh, seeing C++ code. And uh, this is the file for, well, an ext extract from the file for a small prime FFT in NTL. So this is just for FFT over Z over PZ for P, uh, relatively small, uh, up to 60 bits which is not that small, but it fits into a machine world. This file is five, well, there are three related files which are 5,500 lines of code, just for FFT. The only operation this does is FFT. Okay, and then one, that's the basic operation you focus on, FFT for polynomial multiplication. Once you have this, you can do polynomials and with about the same amount of lines, you can do multiplication, truncated inversion, division, interpolation, etc., etc. <coughs> Again, that's reduction. Focus on the most important basic operation, and then just write algorithms which reduce to it. And actually, these algorithms are fairly simple. This is how to do Euclidean division for polynomials in NTL. So you have some base cases, and then it's just a few lines, and it's very close to the algorithm. So take the degrees of the polynomials, then uh, base case, if you have nothing to divide, just return. And then the algorithm that you may know is uh, reverse the size of the, reverse the coefficients of the polynomials, do some power series inversion and products, and then reverse again, and that's it. So that's exactly what you have here. Reverse, do some inversion of truncated series, etc. There is some FFT stuff for efficiency, but you can see that it's very close and short. Uh, everything, all the difficulty in implementation is hidden in this FFT thing. Okay, so reductions are important. Maybe I mentioned it already. So concentrate your efforts on improving the basic routines, and if you don't like basic routines, just let other people do it, and then uh, focus on good reductions. So more precisely, the reductions that we have for linear algebra, uh, they work between almost every problem, uh, basic problem at least, so you can do in the same time as matrix multiplication all of these things. So this is matrix multiplication, and using these reductions, and this is actually what is done in practice as well, this is uh, a picture from the Flask Pack library. So uh, you have linear system solving, you can compute ranks, determinants, all of this reduces uh, nicely to Gaussian emination. Uh, and this is triangular system solving. Inversion is uh, slightly uh, different, but actually it's very close also to Gaussian emination. Uh, recently there were some uh, new reductions using fast polynomial multiplication. There was some reduction from uh, the mean poly and char poly problems to uh, matrix multiplication. So all of these you can do in the same time as matrix multiplication. Okay. One problem which is not close, for example, is how to compute the Frobenius normal form is in the same time as matrix multiplication. This we don't know. It's not 
completely open, I'm going to say, but it's not closed. Uh, something which is really open, oh, sorry, we have this reduction which tells us that computing a determinant is uh, not easier than matrix multiplication, which is maybe not very intuitively uh, simple, but that's the case. Uh, which tells you also that computing the character experimental, which includes the determinant, is not easier as well. Uh, something which is completely open, as far as I know, is how to solve a linear system faster than matrix multiplication. Well, is it possible? We don't know. Maybe. The reductions here work both ways, which tells you that inverting is not faster than matrix multiplication, and matrix multiplication is not faster than inverting. Both are the same complexity. If you improve one, you improve the other. For linear system solving, we just have a one-way reduction, so maybe it's possible to solve a linear system in n square. We don't know, so if you don't know what to discuss tonight and what, so what problem to solve, you can, you can try this one. Of course, if you manage to solve linear systems faster than n cube or n omega, then this has deep consequences, I suppose. So the problem is not very easy. Uh, some notes uh, quickly. So uh, there is this paper above which gives you nice explicit reductions because sometimes, so I did a similar beginning of talk a few months ago and people told me I never found a paper where you can actually find these reductions. So this is one paper where you can find the reductions and it, give, it gives you as well some constants in the big O's which can be useful for some analysis sometimes. And when I said not closed for the Frobenius form, this is because uh, there is actually a randomized algorithm for Frobenius normal form in the same time as matrix multiplication. So it's a Las Vegas randomized algorithm, which requires that you have a field of sufficient size. If it's F2, that doesn't work well, you have to go to an extension. Okay, so uh, this is very nice, but doesn't close the question completely. And we have some recent developments that give us some idea of maybe it's possible to reach matrix multiplication time deterministically over any field. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about deterministic algorithms all the time, okay? No, no randomized algorithm as far as, as far as possible. Now about polynomials, uh, we have lots of nice problems. So these ones are the same time as uh, matrix multiplication. Multiplication, of course, itself by FFT. Uh, I denote this time as M of D. That's the time for multiplying two polynomials of degree D. It's like the M to the omega. It's a notation for polynomials. So division with remainder, you can actually do in the same time as polynomial multiplication. And this uses truncated inverses like this. There is no additional log, thanks to Newton iteration. And all of these problems here, they are in M of D log D, there is an extra log a priori in most cases. So you can evaluate a polynomial in several points, in D points, D is the degree of F. You can do Lagrange interpolation in M of D log D. These algorithms are close to each other somehow, they use similar tools. And then you have a family of three related algorithms uh, which, are, which I will talk about again in, in this lecture later which are Pade approximation, you want to rewrite a polynomial F as a fraction of two polynomials of degree D, half of D, D over two, modulo X to the D. And this is very close to computing the minimal generating polynomial of a linearly recurrent sequence, uh, better commercy algorithm, but a fast version of it. And this is again very close to computing extended GCDs. So you have F and G, you want to compute the GCD and also this U and V. So there are some questions here. Uh, can we do polynomial multiplication in D log D? I mentioned the question already. Can we remove this extra log in uh, the complexity of these two problems here? Sometimes, yes. Uh, we have some cases where we can. Can we remove the log in these problems? This seems to be open of a different nature. It's not the same kind of algorithm. Uh, and can we, so there are some problems like modular composition. I'm going to talk about it in the second lecture. Can we actually get closer to polynomial multiplication time for this problem? We don't know yet if we can 
get something uh, in the same time up to logarithms or not. This seems like a very basic problem. You have three polynomials, you do f of g modulo h. The size is well controlled, the output has a size d, the input has size 2d, 3d. And uh, currently we have uh, d to the power something 1.4 or something like this. Okay, so there are some open problems even on these very basic operations still. A quick word about uh, some of uh, these uh, results. So uh, this is open, but actually there are many cases where we have this complexity for multiplication. Uh, if you have a nice root of unity, you can do FFT, then you have this. If you have, uh, did I read it? Yeah. So in practice, we often rely on this by creating roots of unity, uh, doing things that are not really in the algebraic model anyway. And there is recent progress having this complexity in the bit complexity model. So it's slightly different, but this gives a nice hope for reaching this. And something uh, I wanted to mention for the rest of the talk is that we can do interpolation and multipoint evaluation in D log D or the same time as polynomial multiplication without extra log. If you have FFT points or special points like points in a geometric progression, you have a one Q, Q, Q square, etc. If you take special points, you can then do a multipoint evaluation in the same time as polynomial multiplication. No extra log. There are many contexts where you can actually choose your points. Uh, we are going to see one very soon. Then you can choose your points in geometric sequence and then you get uh, faster interpolation and evaluation. Okay, so some words about software since I mentioned we, we want to implement things. So you maybe know about this, uh, this software. So Sage is a general purpose software which gathers many libraries it includes many open source libraries and gives a common interface to them. In particular, it includes uh, Linbox and Flashpack, which are about exact linear algebra over the integers, over uh, finite fields, etc. And it, it includes as well NTL and Flint, uh, which are focused in particular on polynomials, but have many more things as well. So very important when you implement things is to choose the right algorithm. Uh, if we work on alg algorithms, it's not for implementing the naive ones. This makes a big difference, of course. Data structures and storage, unfortunately, sometimes uh, are important. It's not always the funniest part of the implementation work. You have to care about how, efficiency, how efficient, in terms of memory, your program is. Uh, do you access elements that are close by in memory? This actually makes big differences, in particular for matrices, for example. You can waste a factor of 10 because you don't respect this. And nowadays, you have to be careful about exploiting vectorization. If you don't know what this is, uh, just forget it. If you know, then uh, either write vectorized code, which is sometimes not very funny as well, but uh, you can also try to rely on automatic vectorization nowadays by unrolling your, unrolling your loops a bit. And, and this again can lead to faster code by a factor of two, five, etc. So here, what can you do about, uh, in about one second for matrices and for polynomials? For matrices, you can do Gaussian elimination in size about 4,000 by 4,000 in one second. On this old laptop, which doesn't have AVX 512 uh, and which is old, uh, I guess with a better laptop, you could do almost twice the size. So that's uh, 16 million coefficients, and you can compute Gaussian elimination in one second. The field is Z over PZ for all my experiments. Z over PZ for P, a prime of 60 bits. So it has 60 bits. It's a bit large. Uh, linear system solving is basically the same time as Gaussian elimination, just do this, uh, do this LU decomposition and then do some triangular solving which is free almost. Matrix multiplication is actually, oops, is actually uh, slower than Gaussian elimination. So you can, in one second you can multiply matrices of size about 3000. 
So this is not so well known, I think, but that's what is predicted by a theory. The constant in the big O for matrix multiplication is actually larger, it's 2n cube, uh, than the constant in the big O for Gaussian elimination. Inverse is the same as uh, multiplication almost, and the uh, Chapoli in this implementation is slightly slower. Uh, we have not yet tried to do the most recent Chapoli one. It seems to be a bit faster, but I don't want to make uh, bold claims. Okay, and for polynomials, you can multiply two polynomials uh, of a few million coefficients in one second. You can do a Euclidean division with remainder in about the same time. So you have four million coefficients. XGCD and the mean poly of a sequence, of a linearly recurrent sequence, uh, you have a bit smaller size. So you can notice here that I have a factor of about 20, 20, 30 between these things. Here this is M of D, here this is M of D log D. If you take the log of 10 to the 6, log in base 2, you have more or less 20. So the factor of 20 is unavoidable with the current algorithms. And this one here is quite slow. In one second, you have only 10,000 points for multipoint evaluation. The reason is very simply that this is not using the right algorithm. This is NTL. It's using the naive uh, repeated Horner evaluation. Uh, so you can see that this should be actually on the level of this or even maybe a bit faster than this. So here we waste at least a factor 20 because the algorithm is not the right one. And again, using reductions, implementing the right algorithm is extremely concise and not so difficult. The thing is, I guess, uh, this was not needed in NTL, so this was not focused on, and that's it. How many points do you evaluate? Uh, the same as the degree. The same as the yeah. So this is uh, 10,000 times Horner evaluation of the same polynomial. D square complexity. Okay, uh, I wanted to show two problems, two very basic problems about matrices before, well, to motivate us to look at polynomial matrices, which I have not introduced yet. So that's a problem for matrices, not polynomial ones. I have a matrix M by M, an integer. I want to compute A to the K, basic problem. What's the complexity? Can someone tell us? How would you do this, maybe? A keyword for this. Oops. Any idea? Uh, I guess yes. Binary powering? Yes, binary powering, thank you. Binary powering is the natural thing to compute powers in computer science in any kind of domain. Uh, so binary powering or repeated squaring or fast exponentiation, whatever. The complexity would be the complexity of multiplication times the log of the exponent, k. If you don't know much about computer algebra, you would think that's the best we can do. How can you be faster than this? It's a, a square, f, a4, how can you go faster to the power you want? Actually, it was shown already 30 years ago that you can do better by exploiting the fact that you have a matrix, you can compute its Frobenius form, which gives you access to some polynomial operations. <coughs> so Gisbrecht showed that you can uh, do this kind of things with the Frobenius form, and Steuerhan showed how to compute the Frobenius form fast. And then you have this kind of complexity here for any log k which is in big O of m. If log k is m, then this would be m to the omega plus one. Here, it's basically, uh, there is no k appearing. If, if log k is m, you have this complexity. So you can compute much larger powers uh, of the matrix in the same time. <coughs> With polynomial matrices, we actually reduced this recently to this complexity here, uh, which is even closer to m omega. And it's not, it's not unlikely that one day we can reach m omega for, for this problem. Okay, so sometimes you have to 
think that you have specific objects and you can use their properties to try to de design more efficient algorithms than what you would do in a generic algorithm, let's see. A related problem somehow, so here can we reach m omega, it's unclear, but there is nothing that tells us it's not possible. At least using polynomial matrices and Frobenius form, we, we can act, at least uh, improve quite a lot the basic results. <coughs> Another problem is this one, grid of H rates. Um, so it happens in many places. Uh, we encountered it, it a lot in my team with uh, Gramner basis computations, for example. You can encounter it when you compute characteristic polynomials also. You have a matrix and a vector, and you want to compute v, a v, a square v, etc., up to m, a m minus 1 v. So you want to repeatedly apply the matrix to the vector. And then maybe you have to do some very messy to find some uh, generator of a sequence or something like this. Okay, uh, what is the complexity of this? Naive complexity of this. Maybe it's less uh, straightforward than. So a naive algorithm is just to use matrix vector multiplication m times, or m minus one times, I guess. And then this costs uh, m times m squared. That's m cube. Actually, there was a scheme showed by Kellogg. Based on repeated squaring, but not only this, a bit more, which tells us that we can do it in m omega log m. So the same time as a naive exponentiation of a to the m. In fact, here, using polynomial matrices, we can actually reach m omega without any log. So we do have m omega, and uh, I will propose this as an exercise this afternoon. Uh, it's actually easy to see how to do this. If, we, if you take as a black box the difficult algorithm from, for polynomial matrices, it's easy to derive this result. It's not clear that we cannot do better than this. Uh, it seems difficult, but who knows? Maybe we can do better than m omega for this problem. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't even thought about this. Uh, so usually having lower bounds on complexity is quite a difficult problem. Okay, uh, to conclude this first part, which is taking longer than I guessed, um, just a few words about what I will talk about for polynomial matrices for software. So I, there is Sage that I mentioned before. So the goal there is to have a complete thing which provides all the routines you need, even if it's not very fast initially, that's okay. Uh, it's uh, used by a lot of people. And uh, so recently we had Sage days, for example, and. Xavier Caruso came to me, I need to solve this, and we just uh, added something to Sage. At the moment, it's quite slow, but maybe it will be fast uh, in a few months. Uh, so uh, the goal is to have something complete and to be able to experiment with the, algeb the algebraic computations. Then there is this uh, place where you have some polynomial matrices. Uh, so it's focusing on the basic operations, very optimized. It's really fast for polynomial matrix multiplication and for Hamid Pad approximation in particular. And uh, recently we have launched uh, work on developing a polynomial matrix library, which is based initially on NTL and nowadays we are moving towards Flint. So it's growing a lot. Uh, we develop it mostly with Eric Schost and uh, sometimes some other people help. And we welcome any uh, comments or suggestions, uh, reports of bugs, uh, reports of I don't manage to compile it, etc. And this is the library that I'm going to use for all the timings that I'm going to show in this talk. Okay, so we try to uh, implement most algorithms and to have something as fast as we can. So, uh, yeah. All right, that's the end of the first part. If you have uh, questions, please let me know. Yes? So in the last slide, <laughs> the Linux has many more things that we don't try to do, like uh, matrix of uh, rationals or integers, or it's more general. Uh, there is an overlap at the moment. The polynomial matrix part of Linux is also in uh, PML at the moment. So, yeah.
It was difficult, so it, it, it was a choice we had to do at the beginning, whether to work directly in Inbox or create something else. Uh, it was a difficult choice because the thing is, uh, we wanted to take into account all the things that were done already for FFTs. We didn't want to rewrite the 6,000 lines of code for FFT. Uh, so we, NTL was a nice choice for this. Uh, also, there was already some work on structured matrices on NTL, so we had some reasons to choose NTL. That's how it is. <laughs> uh, so we sometimes discuss, uh, and I've discussed many times about this with uh, Pascal Georgi, who is uh, doing this code in Linbox, and we exchange ideas. But for the moment, it's separate, and there's are some overlap. Other comments or questions? Okay, and then I will continue. So maybe we should talk about polynomial matrices before the end of this morning's lecture. So uh, what are they and uh, why do we use them? So this is a polynomial matrix. Uh, so I will denote by this the set of polynomial matrices, k of x, m to the n, m by n. And it looks like this. It's a matrix with three univariate polynomials inside. That's it, nothing uh, particular. So the, the same way as matrices over a field co correspond to vector spaces somehow, here a matrices over k of x correspond to what we call three modules over k of x. If you don't know about mo what modules are, it's not very important for the rest of the talk. Uh, basic operations are naturally addition and multiplication as always. And k of x is not a field, as you know which uh, brings some issues, like uh, you don't want to divide by a non-constant polynomial, for example. You want to stay over k of x as much as possible. So you can always say that such a matrix is over the rational fractions. You can say this, but you have to be very careful. We are going to see why. Examples you already know of polynomial matrices is uh, in the definition of the characteristic polynomial of a matrix, I have a, m, a constant matrix, then x, i, minus m has a determinant which is called the characteristic polynomial of m. This is a polynomial matrix here. It's a lightly polynomial, it has just a few x's here and there, but it's still a polynomial matrix. So that's an example you know already. And actually, the fastest known algorithm for computing the characteristic polynomial uses polynomial matrix operations, starting from this degree one matrix, to large, uh, smaller matrices with larger polynomials inside. And an example of small matrices with large degree, uh, it's the XGCD operation, actually corresponds to a transformation of polynomial matrices. So you have your F and G, you want the GCD, and you have here a matrix of determinant one, which gives you the GCD and zero. And this is actually how the problem is seen when you implement it, or if you do the fast half GCD algorithm, that's what happens behind the scenes. So if you open NTL's code for uh, the XGCD, then you will see that you have two by two matrices, etc. So it's really a polynomial matrix problem, two by two. So it's not the most uh, interesting ones in terms of polynomial matrices, but this is still a polynomial matrix example, which is actually generalized to uh, interesting things for the matrix case. Other cases where we encounter polynomial matrices is when you work on sparse matrices of a K. So you have a big sparse linear system of a field. Then the strategy is to uh, compute lots of matrix vector products like we, ju we just saw, and then do some uh, better messy to find a, a generator of a sequence. And this allows you to solve this kind of systems uh, quite faster than if it was a general, a general system. So for sparse linear system solving, you use polynomial matrices, in particular if you want to do it uh, with the block Wiedemann algorithm. Another case which is uh, directly related to polynomial matrices is uh, structured matrices. Imagine a matrix where you have uh, repeated elements on the entire diagonals. So this has a particular structure. This is called a Henkel matrix. And when you have matrices like this, or blocks like this in a matrix, then you can work faster with the matrix using this structure. 
And this use, actually, this uses uh, polymer matrix multiplication and things related to a matrix version of the GCD. A third situation is a bivariate interpolation problem. And uh, you want to evaluate or interpolate a bivariate polynomial at some given points. So you have points like this in K2, endpoints. You have a polynomial, you want to compute the evaluation at all these points. This will be an exercise this afternoon as well. Uh, so how to do this fast? This actually uses uh, polynomial matrix multiplication. This is Nuskin and Ziegler's algorithm. And another question is how to find a small degree interpolant which, ca which cancels all the points. And this is related to what we call m per day approximation or vector interpolation, etc. And this I'm going to talk about maybe this morning or tomorrow. Uh, so this is directly related, for example, to uh, list decoding problem in coding theory. Uh, so for Ruth Solomon list decoding by the Gorissimi Solomon algorithm, you exactly have this problem of finding p of small degree, which vanishes at all the points. Okay, so they are useful uh, for several types of problems, which don't always include polynomial matrices in the problems. <coughs> Uh, now we should see how to compute with these matrices. So, as we mentioned, we can say that matri matrices in this are also in uh, over the rational fractions. And this is a field, so that's more comfortable. This matrix over a field, we can work as usual. So we can define addition, multiplication, determinant, etc. Uh, in fact, these don't involve the, uh, divisions, but you have to be careful. Who tells you that there is no division in the algorithm which actually multiplies or in the algorithm which computes the de determinant? Determinant is typically Gaussian elimination for matrices. So even though the definition, mathematical definition has no division, maybe the algorithm has. Um, at least from this, we can define the rank of a, ma of a polynomial matrix. Just see the matrix as a matrix of the fractions and look at the rank. And that's it. And you can define the inverse of a matrix, but the inverse will be over the fractions. It's not clear that the inverse will be over the polynomials. It's the case for some matrices, which we call unimodular. Uh, so if the inverse is over the polynomials, then uh, this corresponds to the fact that the determinant is a non-zero constant. So you can see that not all the matrices have this, but it's an important family of matrices. When this is not the case, then the inverse is a fraction, a matrix of the fractions. <coughs> so related to this determinant remark here, you may want to compute the determinant by Gaussian elimination over the fractions. Actually, this is exponential time. This is an exercise this afternoon, again. Uh, exponential time, it should do this. So you have to be careful when you try to adapt algorithms from matrices directly to polynomial matrices. This can work uh, not so nicely sometimes. So in short, this uh, viewpoint is useful for definitions and properties, uh, but very often for algorithms, it's not good, except for maybe uh, addition, <laughs> then it's okay. But uh, usually it's not good. Uh, it ignores the degree growth that happens and uh, the cost bounds are too coarse because if you apply cost bounds directly, this will tell you that multiplication in K of X M to the M is M cube or M omega operations in the fractions. But you have no clue about the degree, so this makes no, you cannot deduce something about this. So you really need to consider the degrees of the entries in the matrix if you want to say something which is meaningful in terms of complexity. And one way to do this is to see the matrices as polynomials over the, re the <laughs> set of matrices, the vector space of matrices here. So that's a polynomial viewpoint this time. Uh, this thing is isomorphic to this. So polynomials with matrix coefficients. This matrix that I showed you before, you can rewrite it as this. It's a polynomial in X with matrix coefficients. <laughs> Okay, so now I can see what I can use from what I know about polynomials to work with this object. Uh, first, I can see that there is a natural notion of degree. I can just take the largest power of x with a non-zero coefficient. 
then I have a degree. One uh, subtlety is that in general you have this. Uh, you don't have equality all the time. Unlike for polynomials of a field, if you multiply two matrices, maybe the product has uh, degrees strictly less than the sum of the degrees. And actually this arises here for this matrix. If you take it to the, the cube, then you have degree eight instead of uh, nine that you would expect from the three here. But still you can define a degree and uh, this allows you at least to bound the degrees of things. Related to this, uh, so I want to highlight that degree growth enhances the computational aspects. So again, if you want to compute the nth power a to the n, but this time for a polynomial matrix a. So I have this matrix, it's a fixed matrix here. How do I compute the nth power a to the n? And my goal is to show that uh, these degree things here are somehow, yeah, it makes, it makes the context richer in terms of uh, computations. So if you apply repeated squaring like we just mentioned before, then there will be degree growth. So here you will be multiplying a by a, it's in degree three. Then you will multiply the result of this by itself. So you get uh, degree six by degree six then etc etc but the degree is growing all the time so here you have degree more or less n at the end and you are multiplying two matrices of degree more or less n okay uh, in fact you can solve this problem here in just because of n operations in the field if you apply this you are multiplying polynomials of degree n so you expect at least n log n maybe more than n log n maybe log log n or something but you can do it in big O of n, uh, which is faster than just the last step of repeated squaring and doesn't use FFT at all. And the strategy is just to find a recurrence satisfied by your output, well, your result, a to the n, and to unroll it. Okay, so uh, again, the degree growth makes the computation a bit uh, more difficult here. Because when you do repeated squaring, you are increasing the degree all the time. And this tells you that maybe there are smarter ways to deal with this degree growth. So the message maybe again also is that uh, repeated squaring is nice, but it's not always the best tool you, you can use. Okay, so in short for this viewpoint, polynomial viewpoint, it gives us a natural notion of degree of a polynomial matrix. It tells us that we can add two matrices in M and D operations in K, uh, where D is the minimum of the degrees. And it tells us also that we can truncate a matrix modulo X to the N, just to remove coefficients. Uh, we can shift by some power of X. We can evaluate at a point. If you have a matrix like this, uh, or a polynomial like this, you can just use Horner evaluation. It works, there's no problem. So there are some things that we can, we can directly adapt from the polynomial algorithms. Uh, in particular, if we take a square matrix, then this thing is a ring, which is not commutative. So we have polynomials in one variable over some non-commutative ring. So we can do actually multiplication as a product of polynomials over this uh, strange ring, okay? So the complexity maybe is not so clear. We have to discuss this. Uh, is it the case that we have this complexity for, for this problem? Um, it's true for the best known M of D at least. So we'll give more details just afterwards. Can you do truncated inversion? So uh, computing A inverse modulo X to the N. So the main question is, can we apply the usual Newton iteration for polynomials to these uh, polynomial matrices? And can we do Euclidean division with remainder? What does it mean? Because we need the think that device to be non-zero. What does it mean? Does it work? And what's the complexity? So we'll answer these questions uh, in the algorithms we are going to see. But before concluding this small part, I want to show that uh, this viewpoint here seems to be quite nice in terms of algorithms. It gives us many algorithms we can reuse from polynomials, but it has one limitation at least, that it ignores uh, the degrees, the individual degrees in the matrix. So imagine a matrix where you have 
all constants everywhere except one polynomial which is very large in the first entry, for example. Then this viewpoint here is telling you that this is a polynomial of degree, the degree of f, with matrix coefficients. So the data structure to represent this is d plus one matrices in KMM, even though most entries are a very uh, small degree, a constant. So the representation is m squared times d plus one. And if you add two such matrices, it's m squared d plus one. And in practice, if you use this representation, which is one we use sometimes, it's really, uh, you really have this representation size. When you look at it, you want to say that this is actually just one point of degree D and more or less M square coefficients. So you would like to have this kind of size and this kind of complexity for, uh, for this specific matrix. So one problem with this viewpoint is that it ignores completely the individual degrees in the matrix. It is still a nice uh, viewpoint which helps for algorithms. Okay, so uh, let's turn to this, uh, these algorithms. Um, maybe you have questions? I think you have to wait for the mic microphone. Can you come back to the previous slide? I can. This I can do. Yes. So, so this example uh, seems very artificial. So do you have something else in mind or, or family of problems where something similar occurs? Uh, yes, this one is artificial indeed. What is less artificial is a case where the first column, the first column is completely of degree D and the rest is a constant or something. And typically, if you take a random matrix, you compute its Hermit form, you will have a matrix like this. The first column is very large and the rest is constant. And you have exactly the same problem, so it will, the difference between the two here would be slightly less dramatic, but it would still be quite large. So yes. <laughs> Another question or comments? No? Okay, so let's see a few algorithms now. I will not talk about addition. If you want to add two polynomial matrices, just add them, and that's it. Uh, but I will talk about multiplication. So the naive multiplication of polynomial matrices is just a mix of the naive multiplication of matrices and of polynomials. There is nothing special. Apply the cubic algorithm to uh, matrices, and then multiply the polynomials using the naive quadratic algorithm. One may want to reach something like this, which is the nicer mix of fast algorithms for multiplication. In fact, we can do better than this. And we can do better than this using this polynomial viewpoint, seeing the matrix as a polynomial with matrix coefficients, because uh, the fastest known multiplication algorithm for polynomials was written in a nicely general way. So it allows for coefficients which are in a strange space, let's say. So, um, this is the counter kirchhoffian algorithm for multiplication, the fastest general algorithm we have over, over an abstract field. And what it tells you is that uh, you, you can multiply over with coefficients from an arbitrary, not necessarily commutative, not necessarily associative even, algebra. So that's our case. We have k to the m by m. That's matrices, it's not commutative. And if you multiply polynomials like this, then you have what as the complexity? So you uh, multiply polynomials in degree less than n. That's my, my D there, actually. Uh, in n log n multiplications in the algebra and n log n log log n additions in the algebra. So they separate the number of multiplications and additions, which tells me that actually uh, in front of m omega, you have just D log D. This is this term here. You have n log n or d log d multiplications of coefficients which are matrices. And there you have this number of additions which uh, gives you an m square because when you add matrices, it's just m square. So you gain from the fact that in fact, uh, matrix multiplication is uh, slower than, you have fewer operations in front of the, the more expensive thing. 
So this is better than multiplying m omega m of d, which would be m omega times this d log d log log d. Okay. I'm going. I'm not going to describe more what uh, how this works. Uh, this is the basic routine that needs to be optimized and we trust that this works and is fast. I should have shown timings at actually here, but anyway, I uh, didn't think about it. Um, so multiplication is done through this FFT-like algorithm, which is based on evaluation and interpolation. That's really the basic framework. So there's an exercise here, uh, which we can work on this afternoon. That's lots of things. Or exercises, maybe you noticed. Um, so how to do multiplication by evaluation interpolation? In particular, if you have special points, you can do it uh, faster than what we saw. How to do determin determinant by evaluation interpolation? So what does this mean? Um, maybe I can write things on the board. I forgot to mention shocks. I just want to highlight what this means to do evaluation interpolation. So you start with a matrix, which I called, I didn't call it. So let's call it A. Let me know if it's not big enough. So I have this matrix. I want to compute that A. What do I mean by evaluation interpolation? It's a fact that if you have a point alpha in K, then you can, you can see that the determinant of A of alpha is the same as the determinant of A evaluated in alpha. So A is a polynomial matrix. This is a constant matrix. I take its determinant. It's the same as computing the determinant of the polynomial matrix and evaluating it in alpha. So evaluation interpolation is uh, Taking lots of points alpha, sufficiently many, this is for you to uh, work out how many, uh, so as to have enough evaluations for this determinant, I will evaluate alpha, A, sorry, I will evaluate A in many points. I will compute determinants of constant matrices using Gaussian elimination or what you prefer. So I will get this polynomial here in many points, and then I can interpolate to recover the polynomial. Okay. So the questions are, how many points do I need? What's the complexity, etc. I will give the answers, but not the algorithm. Um, what would be the degree of, uh, of the determinant? Yeah, that's exactly the question. Uh, how many points you need is uh, related to the degree of the output polynomial. So that's uh, actually, no, it's not written here. It's the hint. You need to look at degree bounds for the things you are computing to be able to have enough points. And also, having enough points means that you need to have a field large enough, which is not always uh, so nice. So for multiplication, this allows you to improve what we saw in the previous slide. If you have a field where you can find uh, sufficiently many points in a geometric sequence, then you can actually have m omega d instead of m omega d log d. And this is really what we have in practice. So it's better than this, and it's even better than the one we saw on the previous slide. And for determinant and inversion, you get this kind of complexity, m omega times the number of points, and the number of points is m d. So this reduces to what? If you look at it, what are the core operations that we use here? We are going to use operations on polynomials, evaluation, interpolation. And we are going to use operations on constant matrices, for example, constant, computing a determinant, uh, inverting, etc. So these are only reductions to polynomial multiplication and matrix multiplication. And here, uh, the best known algorithm for these tasks are actually faster, m omega d and m cube d. And this directly reduces to polynomial matrix multiplication itself. Okay, so that's one way to create fast algorithms, uh, is to use evaluation interpolation. So it's fast, but it's not so nice. In particular, if you have a matrix which has a large dimension, then you have an extra M that you would like to remove here in the complexity, comp which is removed in the best algorithm. 
This is an extract from, so now I'm going to turn uh, to other uh, algorithms using the Poignard viewpoint. So this is an extract from the book uh, Algorithm Efficace en Calcul Formé. It's in French. Uh, sorry for this, but I, I saw it in the Francophone uh, Computer Algebra Days, so. So, uh, yeah, I could talk in French, in fact. That would be not very nice. Um, anyway, so this is in French, but you can read French, I'm sure, because it's mathematical symbols, in fact. So this is Newton inversion for uh, computing inversion of truncated series. And if you look at the lemma here, again, we have something a bit general. So that's the advantage of writing general statements. Let A be some maybe not commutative ring and F be some power series over this A. So here I can take the ring of, mat of square matrices, okay? And I can apply this directly to uh, power series over the matrices. So I can apply this to do the truncated inversion for polynomial matrices, in fact. Directly, I don't have to change anything. I don't have to think about it. I just have to trust the authors. Uh, I will do because they are here, most of them. So I prefer not to risk my life. Um, so if I trust them, then I have a square matrix A and this tells me that A is invertible as a power series if its constant term is invertible. So I look at the first coefficient, the constant coefficient. If it's invertible, then this is invertible as a power series. And if that's the case, then you can compute this inverse, truncated inverse in this complexity. So this is the complexity of multiplying two matrices m by m of degree big N. The degree of A doesn't play a role here. It's just a precision an N that plays a role. In particular, there is no extra log for this operation. As we mentioned for polynomials, it's the same thing. Because basically you have a geometric uh, sum of N over two plus N over four, N over eight. So you have an extra factor two maybe, but you don't have a log factor. So that's a very good reduction to polynomial matrix multiplication. And if you look at it uh, in practice, it works quite well. It's just a bit slower than multiplication in the same size and degree. And it's a constant factor of between two and three somehow. Okay, so this is uh, for m by m matrices of degree d, you get this kind of timings. Again, over z over pz for prime p of 60 bits. Okay, so that's a nice algorithm which we can use for division with remainder uh, using again the polynomial tools. But now there is, uh, okay, I have a statement here for the problem of division with remainder and I have a question which is in green. Uh, do we miss anything here? Is there some assumption that I forgot? A very classical case of forgotten assumption. Is this problem always feasible? Some of you already know, I think, because uh, <laughs> some of you have seen this slide already. So the assumption that misses is that when we divide by something, usually it has to be non-zero. Okay, so don't divide by zero. It doesn't work well. Um, so here my B should be non-zero, this B here. I want to divide by B, if it's zero, uh, I cannot get a remainder of degree S than B. And it's not just for fun, so when I write this, it's also because what does it mean? Is it enough not to be zero for B in the case of polynomial matrices? That's, that's the main reason why I focus on this problem. Uh, so we have to, to look at it and actually it's a bit more complicated than being non-zero. So if you have a polynomial over some ring, you can divide by P, which is my big B there. If P is monic, if the leading coefficient is one, that's fine. Or if you can invert the leading coefficient of P in, in the ring. It's not only non-zero, it's a bit more complicated. When that's the case, then it's fine. So in our case, this means that if I look at my polynomial matrix B, I'm going to divide by B. I want the leading coefficient B, which is a constant matrix. I want this to be non-zero, uh, invertible, sorry. I want B to be invertible. Okay, uh, so I take this as extra assumption here. The leading coefficient of B is invertible. 
And then I can just use the usual fast Euclidean division with remainder for polynomials, but for polynomial matrices. So that's the one I showed in NTL code before. Uh, just reverse the equation here, reverse A and B. Compute the quotient uh, by this kind of power series operations. It's very close to Newton iteration that we just saw. And then deduce the remainder because the remainder is just A minus BQ, so multiply and you get R. And the complexity is this. Uh, this for finding Q, because you have operations to do in power series at precision dA minus dB. And then you find R by uh, using this formula, modulo x to, the, x to the db, because the degree of r is uh, at most db minus one. So again, we have a nice reduction without log for division with, with remainder, essentially based on polynomial tools. We don't need to do smart things. And the, the timings that we obtain are like this. Uh, it's again a bit slower than uh, truncated inversion. That's not surprising because we use truncated inversion in, in the algorithm. Uh, but it's just a constant factor, so I, I noticed that there was some gap, maybe due some, to some threshold, there is something strange somewhere. Uh, yeah, this is a factor of three, but here it's a bit less than three, so I don't know, there's a small thing maybe to fix. I will have a look. But roughly, you have a constant factor between uh, these or between these. So that works quite well. And the code is very simple again. It's six lines. So I didn't show the basic thing if the degree of B is less than blah, blah, blah. But basically it's six lines plus some comments to explain what's happening when you read it next year and you don't remember what you, do, what you did. But that's very short thanks to the fact that this is, uh, all the work is here in soft series. This is Newton iteration somehow. And really all the work is in the multiplication algorithm. Again, reductions are quite nice. Use them when you can. Um, so here you can notice that there is some row reverse and some row degree here, R deck of B. When I showed the algorithm before, I didn't talk about R deck. I just took the degree of A, degree of B, etc. So there's something a bit smarter in this code. Uh, well, we hope it's smarter at least. Uh, so what does it mean? It's that you want to refine the matrix degree by taking into account the row-wise or column-wise degrees, for example. And this is better in terms of complexity for the reasons I showed. If you have just one large degree polynomial or just one large column and all the rest is constant, then uh, you want to take this into account in your algorithms. Actually, it also improves the applicability of the algorithm. If you want to divide by a matrix like this, just a diagonal of powers of x, you are not allowed here unless all the powers are the same. I have to be careful, I don't want to... I want you to have coffee, that's important. Um, <laughs> so if the powers are all the same, then okay, the leading coefficient is just the identity, then you can, you can apply this. If you have different powers here on x, then the leading coefficient is going to be a part of identity, not complete identity, so this will not be invertible. So you cannot divide by this, which is quite unfortunate because this just means truncated by some powers, truncated the rows by some powers. So we know it's feasible and easy to do. It's free in terms of computations. But this result here is telling me I can't do this. It's not allowed. So this is also applicability of the algorithm which is improved, enhanced, when you consider row and column wise degrees. So what are these degrees? Um, the row degree is simply the list of the maximum degree in each row. Instead of looking at the whole matrix and the maximum degree, consider the first row, the maximum degree, second row, maximum degree, and do a list of this. So in, with symbols, it looks complicated, but it's very, very easy. Column degree is the same, uh, just a list of maximum degrees for each column. And then you can look at the size of things that you consider. So uh, the sum of row degrees uh, is a better measure than the global degree, of course. And 
Ideally, we would like to take into account the sum of all degrees of the matrix. That's the finest measure we can hope for. That's really the quantity of information in the matrix. But this is usually not very nice uh, in algorithms. It doesn't, it is destroyed by the first multiplication you will do, for example. So this is really hard to take into account. Whereas the sum of row degrees or current degrees is uh, usually a, a good measure. And one example where this arises is determinants. Imagine that you have a matrix with uh, this kind of degrees inside. So that's a polynomial matrix with polynomials of degree 100, 5, 20, and 1. Then you can say that the determinant, if you just look at the formula of determinants, determinant has degree at most 126. Maybe a determinant is zero, we don't know, but at least it's not of degree larger than this. If you take the naive bound, uh, it's a dimension times degree, then you get 400. And this is on a small example. If the matrix is large, then the discrepancy be becomes uh, much larger. So this is one place where we can see that uh, it's good to take this into account. And you can see here as well that if you look at the individual degrees, it's not so easy to, to say something smart about the determinants. You don't want to look at all the possible combinations of all entries and take the max that would be uh, factorial n uh, possibilities to look at. So. Okay, so the example I was mentioning just before uh, for division with remainder more general thanks to these measures. Instead of the largest degree matrix coefficient, we look at the largest uh, degree row in each row. So, for example, here, uh, well, it's three everywhere. So <laughs> I would just take three. And then if this thing, uh, no, sorry, it's for B. It's for B. So I have the B here, I want to divide by B. And the degrees are distinct on the diagonal. So if I take this B here and look at its uh, LC of B, in the previous definition of LC of B, this would be just 0, 0, 0, 2. OK, I take the degree 2 part of this. That's, that's this. This is not invertible. I'm not allowed to divide. Now, if I consider the rows individually, there's a new version, more general. I get 1 and 0, because the first row has degree 1. So I, I, took the, I took the coefficients of degree 1 here and the coefficients of degree 2 here. I get 1, 0, 0, 2. This is invertible. I can divide. So it's a, a theorem that we can divide in this case. And what you get is a remainder. So that's BQ plus remainder. The remainder has degree strictly less than 1 here, because it's degree 1 here, and strictly less than 2 here, because it's degree 2 here. And this is the row reverse and the row degree thing in this uh, division algorithm. OK. Combien de temps? Good Okay. So I have two two slides left, and uh, so one last thing before concluding this first part is uh, what we call partial linearization. That's an important thing to take into account these uh, unbalanced current degrees or row degrees. So uh, take a square matrix. And imagine that maybe the sum of row degrees here is much smaller than the m times the degree, which would be the, the thing if you take the same degrees everywhere. So maybe you have one large row and all the other rows are small, for example. Then this partial linearization, which was introduced by uh, Stoyuhan and uh, Zhu and Laban, mostly, helps you to construct another matrix. It's for free, it's just uh, spreading the coefficients about. It's an expansion somehow. It's just memory operations. So for free, you can construct a matrix like this, which is of slightly larger dimension m prime. So it, you almo at most double the dimension. But you get a s quite smaller degree. So basically, you get the average degree of the rows instead of uh, the max degree. So this matrix has a bit larger dimension, quite smaller uh, degree. 
and you try to preserve the features of your computations. For example, we are going to see an example where you can preserve the, you can find, find the product easily from the expanded versions. Or you preserve the determinants, so this matrix here has the same determinant, or you can't find the inverse of A inside the inverse of A bar, etc. So I, I didn't say how we compute this construction, I'm going to show you a simple example. So we are able to do this, and this allows you to uh, use algorithms designed for the maximum degree of the matrix directly for the case where the degrees are unbalanced. If you have a very large row and small rows, then just expand the first one somehow. Uh, so you get a slightly larger matrix, much smaller degree, and then apply the usual algorithm with respect to the maximum degree, and then you get what you want. So the example for this uh, typical example is just matrix vector multiplication. And I'm going to conclude with this. Uh, so imagine that you have a matrix of degree at most D and a vector of degree at most MD. Okay, so you have a factor M here. The vector is quite larger than the matrix in terms of degree. Then the naive way to compute AU would be, ah, that's not written, I should have written it maybe. Uh, so if you just apply the naive matrix vector multiplication, you have pointers of degree MD everywhere, so you will get M cube D operations. You have uh, M square for matrix met vector multiplication times the multiplication of pointers of degree MD. So you would get uh, M, M cube D plus some logarithm factors. Actually, you can do this in uh, the same time as a multiplication of matrices of size M and degree D. And this is quite better, so that's M omega D plus some logs. And in practice as well, you see a, a large difference between the two. And what's the algorithm? Uh, so you have A and U, that's your product you want to do. U has larger degrees, so you will just split it into uh, smaller degrees and just expand it with respect to degree D. So you rewrite U as uh, a U bar times these powers of X. So it's just a series expansion or X, X D -D expansion of the vector. And so here you will have U modulo X to the D, then the part between D and 2D minus one of U, then the part of 2D until 3D minus one, etc. So this case is very simple. Then you multiply these two matrices, which are two M by M matrices of degree D. So you get this complexity. And then you just gather everything uh, this is multiplication by powers of x, so this is free somehow. You have to be a bit careful because this product has degree 2d, so there is some overlap, but this is just sums of coefficients. Okay, so that's a partial linearization. I won't say more about these techniques, but uh, you will see many times that I will have average degrees in my complexities, and this is because of this kind of uh, strategies. Okay, so that's it for this morning. Thank you very much. and. Uh, Thank you very much for this nice talk. Okay. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just have to wait. Is it uh, yeah. So, so for this average degree thing that in your uh, just the, uh, not the last very last slide but the one before yes where you say that uh, the product is easily de uh, deduced from the product doesn't it matter here to consider row or column degrees yes, it matters a lot in fact multiplication is not the nicest uh, operation for this kind of techniques so for determinants we are always able to or inversion we know how to compute uh, a bar, which is nice. For the product, it's much different. So sometimes the output itself has a large degree everywhere. If you take, uh, if you take a matrix which has, let's say, degree D in the first column, and then constants, so degree zero, and you multiply it by a matrix which has degree D here and degree zero here, you will just get uh, a square matrix with degree 2D everywhere, so there is nothing you can do to be fast. 
Um, the thing is, this is often useful in cases that we encounter in algorithms where you have two reduced matrices, so the rows are controlled in, bo in both A and B, and then we manage to do it. But basically, for A, you would want the rows to be controlled, and for B, the columns to be controlled, and then expand. Um, thank you for the talk. I have a question on the same slide. I was wondering, uh, for example, when you have, uh, it seems that when you have uh, a matrix like this, which is a bit uh, inhomogeneous in terms of degrees that you have, mm -hmm. instead of linearizing it or considering a hay bar, wouldn't be feasible sometimes, I don't know, to apply your algorithm as a subroutine, as a subroutine but on a matrices of smaller size, for example, like here a matrix somehow rectangular where everything is of size of degree D instead of linearizing. Uh, yes, you can try to split the matrix yes, into blocks. Yes. Yeah, or Depending like on the yes. problem, this can yes. be, especially for multiplications, yes. you can try to do these kind of things, yes. So or this yeah. will depend on the problem, of course. Uh, or even, I don't know, something even like, imagine that your matrix is like, uh, I mean, maybe the the row way, the row degree or column degree is more mostly constant. Mm -hmm. I mean, regardless of the row, but the organization within the row or the column is different. Would it be feasible sometimes to multiply by a permutation matrix before, like, I mean, it can help if this allows you to remove the unbalancedness issue. Yes. Okay. Of course. But so sometimes uh, balancedness is. Can be can balancedness be better than unbalancedness? Um, that's true to. I mean, here you want your uh, all your degrees to be of the same order in your matrix A bar. Mm. Are there situations where it would be nice to have the converse? Ah. Uh, if you are able to, if you are yes. able to keep this structure within the algorithm. Yes, uh, there are cases and uh, there are cases where you have. Patterns of degrees that actually make the algorithm faster than it if it was the same quantity of information but balanced, okay. especially in uh, kernel basis computations, to null spaces computations, because basically the degrees are f concentrated in a small part that you handle first, and then the rest is easier to compute. Uh, so sometimes yes, it's mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you prefer not to expand things. This will depend on the algorithm and the problem that you have. Yes. Thank you. Is there an, another question? Okay, so I think it's time for, for the break. Thank you very much. We've